to be here together. For those of you who were on a kayaking trip tomorrow, I'll be watching to make sure you're awake. If I have to be, you have to be. I wanted to, to take us a few minutes before we get started to, to, first of all, if you have children of any age, come and join us tonight at the, the park. Uh, we'll have plenty of hamburgers, plenty of hot dogs, and then a great time of fellowship, and then hopefully a little bit of time to, to spend singing uh, just together and, and being together with one another. I also wanted to share with you this this is our theme this year for camp. Beneath the surface, exploring the parables of Jesus. Uh, we try every year to, to come with a theme that really can, can relate to these, these kids that come to camp, that, that really can help them through their lives. This year, we've chosen several parables. And I want to encourage you, if, if you have kids, or if you are a kid, fourth grade, all, going into fourth grade, all the way up through just graduated high school. I'd love for you to come with us. It's a great, great week. We usually have anywhere from 175 kids up to, we've had up to 230, I believe, in, in some years past. Uh, we have things for all, all ages to, to enjoy. We have Bible class. We have sports, recreation, craft time, swim time. Uh, so it's a, it's a wonderful time which friendships are made. If you are an adult and would love to come with us. I have some spots open for counselors. I would love for you to join us. And if you're a parent of a kid that wants to go, if you come with us, it drops your kid's uh, cost in half. And there's no cost for you to come with us as an adult. So uh, just a, a plug for you to come and join us at camp at Quartz Mountain Christian Camp. It's in just north of Altus, Oklahoma. I'd love for you to, to come and go with us there at the end of July. And if you need more information, feel free to, to ask, to talk to me about that, and to, to really get some more information. I'd love to share with you more about that. The theme this year is from Matthew 13, 35, and I wanted to go into some of the parables today that, that Jesus did teach. In Matthew 13, 35, it tells us, Jesus, this, so this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth on parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. These parables to fulfill those prophecies. Today as we get into these, these two parables that Jesus spoke, two very short parables, two parables all within three verses there of Matthew chapter 13. The important thing, though, first of all, for us to understand is these parables are not a plea for us to sell everything that we have in order to enter the kingdom of God. That's involved in these parables. But we have nothing to offer God, even with all of our possessions. It's of no value, of no worth to Him. Whether these parables are a plea for us to desire God's kingdom above everything else, to place his kingdom as our top priority. One man said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. The emphasis in these parables is not on what we give up, but rather upon the unfathomable new life that's offered to us through Christ. So as we come to this first parable in Matthew 13, verse 44, Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now bearing valuables in a field is, is pretty senseless to us. We don't bury our, our valuables out in our backyard. You, you don't tend to go out and bury your valuables, your, your treasures, your gold, your whatever you have that's of worth. You don't bury that out behind the house. But these people in the first century, in the early days, that's what they did. That's how they protected the things that were of value to them. Today we have banks 
to put your money into your savings account or your checking account. We have places like Edward Jones which you can go and you invest for your retirement or, or your, your children's college. You put these, this money, you put your valuables, maybe your, your prized possessions in a safe deposit box or maybe in a safe there at your house. But you don't, you don't bury it. But in those days of Jesus, they buried them. If they wanted to hide something, to protect something, they dug a hole and they buried it. See, in those days, there was often, especially there in Palestine, often would be raids that would come in and, and they would come in and take your valuables. They would come in and take your belongings. And so the only way you had to protect those was to bury those where they wouldn't be found. But then there were times whenever you would be run out of your home, you'd be run out of town, and you would have to end up leaving those valuables behind. And those things that would be buried in the ground, especially there during, during the, the time of the, the Babylonian exile, when they were run out of, of Israel. These people left behind these treasures. People would then go and, and be digging in a field, would be plowing, preparing the soil, and would stumble upon these treasures often. Uh, they would find gold or, or coins or or whatever someone had buried, and they would find it. Do you remember in Matthew uh, chapter 25, Jesus told a story about a man who gave some talents to three different men. Two of them invested it and returned with profit, but the third one, he buried it. He was afraid of what might happen to that money, and so he buried it to protect it. That was common. Over the years, that land out there in Palestine became... Just a treasure chest full of valuables, full of, of things that people had buried to store, buried to protect. And that treasure, sometimes if a person remembered to get it before they died, would stay there within the family. But other times, that treasure stayed buried forever. Or until somebody found it. Until somebody would dig it up and discover this treasure left behind. So for these people, they understood. This is feasible. This is common everyday life to find a treasure buried in a field. I remember as a kid wanting to buy, find treasure buried in a backyard, and Dad finally said, stop digging it up, Daniel. And we never found any. But for them, it happened often. Sometimes we look at this parable <coughs> And we wonder if this man is being dishonest by finding a treasure in a field, by, by burying that treasure back so that he can then go and buy the field to then get the treasure. Why doesn't he tell the landowner, there's, there's treasure in your field, I found it, maybe you, you forgot it was there. The Jewish rabbinic law for that day and time would tell the people, if a man finds scattered fruit or money, it belongs to the finder. I like that. Finders, keepers, right? Losers, weepers, isn't that how it went? If you find the treasure, it's yours. And so this man found this treasure and he had every right to take that treasure with him. It was his Obviously, the, the owner didn't know it was there. He went and bought the plot of land. And if the owner had known it was there, he would have gone and dug it up before he gave this land to this man. And so now, it belongs to this man. This man was very honest. He could have just taken the treasure. He didn't have to buy the field. He could have used that treasure to buy the field. But he didn't. He took everything he owned. He took all of his possessions. Sold those in order to buy this field. In order to gain the treasure that was there. 
It was valuable. It was worth something to this man. And he gave up all that he had to gain that treasure. But we have to be careful not to lose sight of the point of the parable, which is that a man found something so valuable that he was willing to give everything he had in order to gain that field, to gain that treasure. He was so excited about finding the treasure that he was willing to do whatever he had to do to get it, to purchase it, to own that treasure. But Jesus continues on with another parable in verses 45 and 46 when he says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, once and sold all that he had and bought it. Here's a man who's a merchant. A man who, the original word is where we get our word for emporium. He was a man who would buy wholesale, sell it to a retailer, who would then sell it to the customers. But while he was looking for his things to buy that he could sell to others, he also searched for some for himself. Specifically, he was looking for beautiful pearls. It was a common thing for people, especially entrepreneurs during that day and time, to look for these pearls. Uh, people invested in pearls during, during that time. Uh, they, they wanted the high-quality pearls, especially if you could get them at a low cost. It was valuable. It was worth a lot to find these pearls. If you owned a pearl, you owned a fortune. It, during the early days here, these pearls were seen as we see diamonds today. Great, great value. There's a lot of reason behind that. You don't just find pearls laying out on the beach. You can't just go walk up and down the beach and find a, a shell with a pearl in it. The pearls, especially the ones that they were looking for, lived in these, these oysters that usually thrived at about 40 feet deep. Today, 40 feet isn't a lot for somebody to dive. A scuba diver can go down there and spend a long time searching and looking for these pearls. Even with our equipment, that today they're building newer and better equipment, they still have that opportunity, that ability to find out. But in those days, it wasn't that simple. They didn't have air tanks and masks. Uh, they didn't have the ability to go down there and breathe freely as they searched. Their equipment consisted of a rope and a rock. As you sat in the boat, you'd tie that rock around yourself and you'd fall out and hold your breath as you dropped 40 feet to the floor and you'd hope that while you're there a shark doesn't come along an eel doesn't come along something doesn't come along you also hope that you could just find some of these oysters they say that an average of only one oyster is found in a thousand shells and you've got as long as you can hold your breath and so a lot of people died searching for oysters. A lot of lives were given during this search. And so you can understand why they would be valuable. People didn't just want to give these up after they had worked so hard and sacrificed so much to get these things, these, these pearls. The Jewish Talmud taught that pearls are beyond price. And so for these people that Jesus is talking to, they see a pearl and they see a wealth, a fortune, their life savings. Jesus even discussed the value of pearls in Matthew 7 when he said that not to cast your pearls before swines, right? Don't give something of so much value to the pigs. 
So here's a man going around searching for pearls, selling pearls and other things to retailers, but looking for that one pearl, that one beautiful pearl. And finding that pearl and selling everything he had in order to obtain that pearl. So what do we learn from these parables? Just three verses, right? But there's so much that we find. We see, first of all, the value of the kingdom. There's so much value within the kingdom. Both of them tell us about the incomparable value of God's kingdom. The pearl is an especially appropriate figure for the kingdom because the pearl is the only gem that cannot be improved by mankind. God has made that oyster to be able to create that pearl. And if man so much as nicks or cuts a pearl, the value is gone. But the most valuable of other gemstones that we have are all value based upon their cut and their clarity and their style and, and how they're set. But the oyster is created by God. In Daniel 2, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He had called in Daniel to come interpret this dream of this image, this idol that he had seen in his head. And he wanted to know what this represented. And Daniel came in and told him uh, all the things that the, the, this image represented the different kingdoms, the Babylonian kingdom, the Persian kingdom, the Greek kingdom, followed by then the Roman kingdom. And in chapter 2 and verse 44 of Daniel, it says, And in the days of these kings, talking about the Roman kingdom, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Not a human kingdom, not a kingdom that mankind has any control over, but a kingdom that God will set up, a kingdom that God will establish. And if you remember the piece of the image that represented this kingdom, was from a stone cut without hands. God's kingdom. Not man's kingdom. It's not the church of any man. It's the church that God established. Christ is the head of the church. Christ is what gives value to the church. When you think about how much it means to be a part of the church, to know that Christ gave his life. That Christ died on that cross in order to give us life. In order that we might someday live with God. To give us the opportunity to approach the throne of God. To give us the ability to call him Father. In this kingdom of God. We can't compare that kingdom to anything. We, we hold things in our world of great value. We hold them up. But how can we compare material things with this kingdom of God? How can we compare the blessing of prayer with a brand new car? How can we compare the value of the death on the cross the biggest mansion we can imagine. In Matthew 16, Jesus uses this image of a, of a scale when he asked the question in verse 26, for what is it, for what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul. You pile up everything the world has to offer. Pile up everything that, that is here on this earth for us. 
And then you pile up salvation on the other side and salvation still tips the scale. Nothing compares to that. We want a kingdom involves sacrifice, doesn't it? Have you ever seen something you just had to have? You were walking past a store or through a store and you saw this item and you just have to have it. And so you, you start working to save up your money. As a, as a child, you want that bicycle or that toy and you, you stop eating candy bars. You, you stop uh, spending money on, on different things so that you can save up everything you've got in order to get that one possession. Both of these parables are men who saw something that was of great, great, tremendous value. And so they did everything that they could to get that thing. To get salvation. We look at this and there's a tendency to say, a person got my salvation? Not in the way that we think about buying things. Not in the way that we purchase things. But you can't use your money. You can't use your things to gain salvation. But there is a cost. In Luke 9, now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said unto him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. A man wanted to be a follower of Jesus, wanted to be a disciple, wanted to be there with him. But Jesus, he tells him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of God has nowhere to lay his head. That's great that you want to follow me. That's great Jesus said that you want to be here with me. But there's a price. Give up the things that hold you comfortable. The things that you put your trust in. The things that you put your faith in. He says, you may not have a place to lay your head. There's a cost involved in being a follower of Christ. And Jesus, he never shies away from making sure we know that. But with that cost comes tremendous, tremendous reward and tremendous blessing on our lives. But just as those two men in those parables had to sacrifice to gain their treasures, we also sacrifice to gain ours. Luke 14, Jesus said to make sure to count the cost and to fail to start to building a building without counting your money. To, to go to war without counting your army would be detrimental. Count the cost. Know what it takes. Be ready to pay the price. But we also learn that the kingdom is a source of joy. These men both were joyful. Jesus said, the man who finds the treasure for joy over it goes and sells all that he has. Because of the joy that that treasure brings, he sells everything. It's no sacrifice. It's no difficult thing because of the joy that he gains from getting that treasure. There's no regret. There's no complaining. In fact, that man probably didn't even think of it as a sacrifice. Paul said in Philippians 3, 7, and 8, But whatever gain I had, I counted as lost for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. 
Did Paul make sacrifices? Absolutely. But he did those sacrifices. He, he was willing to give that up for the joy, for gaining Christ. There once were two wealthy Christians, a, a doctor and a lawyer who had gone over to, uh, they were traveling the world and they were in Korea at the time and they were on a bus tour with a missionary who was their interpreter and their tour guide and they saw out the window this, this farm and on this farm was a young boy strapped to a plow, pulling that plow and his dad was following him along behind guiding that plow and in the one of the men took a picture and asked the guy, that, that seems pretty curious. Uh, they must be pretty poor, aren't they? And the missionary said, sure, they are. But let me tell you why. You, you see, last year when we built our place of worship, these, this family wanted to give something to support the church. So they sold their ox knowing that for the next year they would have to use their own manpower to plow their fields. But it wasn't considered a sacrifice to them. They were grateful and thankful that they had an ox to sell to then give that money to the church. They didn't consider it a sacrifice. They considered it a joy. Perhaps the test of our commitment is not so much whether we are willing to make sacrifices for God, but whether we are able to make those sacrifices with joy. There's a lot that has to be given up in order to be a disciple of Christ, in order to be a Christian. But there's a lot to gain. An imaginable, immeasurable amount to gain. And the term sacrifice takes on whole new meaning then for us. And finally we learn that the kingdom is entered under different circumstances for different people. The two parables are, are real similar in a lot of ways. Each parable has a man who finds something and sells his possessions in order to gain that treasure. One man, though, wasn't looking for that treasure. One man stumbled across that treasure on accident, but when he found it, he realized the value that was there. The other man was searching, looking for that treasure, and when he came across it, immediately knew this was it. This is the treasure that I've been waiting my whole life for. There's some people who enter the kingdom and they weren't searching for it. Saul of Tarsus wasn't looking for the kingdom of God. When Jesus appeared to him on the road, he thought he was already in the kingdom. And three days later was baptized into the kingdom of God. Other people who found the same, same way the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4 went to get a drink of water and came back home knowing of her salvation. In John 9, a man was born blind. He just wanted to be healed. But he didn't just receive his sight. He also received the forgiveness of his sins from the Messiah, from the Savior. But then on the other hand, there was the merchant who knew what he was looking for and he wanted something of value. People like the Ethiopian eunuch who knew what he was looking for, he just needed somebody to help him. Cornelius, Lydia, the Philippian jailer. So many people who had heard and wanted to find this treasure and did. It's not important how we find the treasure. It's not important how we find the kingdom of God. What's important is that we do find it. And once we found it, to share that with others. To show that 
to others. There's two things that stand out in these parables. What we need to give up and what you stand to gain when you give it up. We don't like to give things up. Don't take my things. Don't take my precious treasures. Don't take these from me. But then we see what's being given to us, what's being replaced now. We've got to give it up. Jesus said in Luke 9, and he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The world tells us that's foolish, that's crazy. Don't do that. Take what you can and enjoy it. But if we make the sacrifice now, the reward is so, so much greater than we can imagine. In 2 Corinthians 4, as we look to the things that are seen, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient. For the things that are unseen are eternal, are there forever. The kingdom of God truly is a hidden treasure, a precious pearl. There were men that the writer in Hebrews tells us lived their life searching for that treasure. Some willing to give their life to sacrifice all that they had to gain that treasure. And they're held up as an example to us. Are we willing to live a life of faith? Are we seeking that treasure that only God can give? And are we sharing that treasure and pointing others to find that treasure that's found in God's Word? Are you willing to be a part of God's kingdom? It takes sacrifice. But it's a sacrifice that can be made with joy. If you're not a part of the kingdom, we, we'd love for you to join God's kingdom. He, he invites us each and every day to join his kingdom, to be a part of his church. The invitation is always, always open, but today we offer this invitation again to you to extend it. If there's anything that we can do for you today, we ask that you would come forward while we stand and sing this song.